First, we're going to hear Canon Mervyn Tower, who's the parish priest of Corpus Christi in Oxford. And he's going to offer us, uh, to help us deepen our understanding of the Holy Eucharist, beginning, as we always do, with the Scriptures. Well, good morning, everybody. Can I say good morning as well? And it's very nice to be here in Liverpool from Oxford. Everybody thinks that anybody from Oxford is highly intelligent, but I'm sure you uh, that's not always true. We gather together to praise the Lord. And um, I'd just like to read something that was at morning prayer this morning, those of you uh, that have read morning prayer, that is linking the scriptures and the Holy Eucharist in a special way. O oh, praise the Lord Jerusalem, Zion praise your God. He has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed the children within you. He established peace on your borders. He feeds you with finest wheat. And we've always understood the finest wheat that's talked about in that passage from the Old Testament to be referring in a specific way uh, to the Holy Eucharist. I'm sure you all recognize that that is um, part of the Old Testament that I've just read, and also you'd be able to name the number of the psalm. That's true, isn't it? I can't actually see your faces, as as you know, which is very disconcerting. Um, But it's Psalm 147. In our parish at Corpus Christi, as in many parishes, we have a little fun every weekend by doing a, um, a Catholic quiz. It's like a trivia. So every week I make up a question uh, and put the answer in from the week before. And some of the questions, the ones I like the most, are from the scriptures, of course. And some of them are quite easy uh, to answer, like what are the names of the sons of Isaiah? So I'm sure you'd be able to do that. To the more difficult ones, like what were the texts used by the Arians from the Old Testament to prove their point? But anyway, I won't ask you those questions this morning. So what I put there is the Holy Eucharist and the Holy Scriptures. Not the background for the Holy Eucharist in the Holy Scriptures, but the Holy Scriptures uh, and the Holy Eucharist. So those are um, just a little selection of strolls that you'll find in any synagogue. But these are not only just strolls from a synagogue, Uh, because there are also some Christian texts there as well. You can see a cross as well as the Star of David um, at the back uh, of the hall there. But it's a reminder, and this is what I want really to concentrate upon this morning in this brief presentation, of the total link between the Scriptures and the Holy Eucharist. They can't be separated, the one from the other. And indeed, um, what can be said about the Holy Scriptures can be also said about the Holy Eucharist and vice versa, pari pastun, not exactly, but to a large degree. So what are the fundamental principles that I'm just going to look at uh, over the next uh, half an hour or so? And these are the things I really would like to uh, focus upon. So we cannot grow fully in our veneration of the Eucharist unless these three points are in place. One, we grow in veneration, respect, and appreciation of the richness of the Holy Scriptures, both Old and New Testament. The Old Testament, as we'll see, is very important for understanding what the Eucharist and the veneration of the Eucharist is all about. It gives us a paradigm of what holiness is and a paradigm of veneration. And I'll just remind you of... um, Paragraph 21 of Dave Erbum. Um, Dave Erbum, uh, as I'm sure you remember, uh, was the document that came from the Second Vatican Council on Revelation from 1965 and still remains, like all the documents of the Second Vatican Council, still remains such an important text for our reflection and theological development. So in Dave Erbum chapter six, which is paragraph 21, it says the church has always venerated the sacred scriptures as she venerates the body of the Lord. 
Now that's um, a very strong verb that's used there, to venerate. So we're venerating the scriptures as we venerate uh, the body of the Lord. And we can almost expand St. Jerome there. And St. Jerome spent many years of his life, as you know, in the cave near the place of the nativity at Bethlehem, translating these scriptures um, into Latin, which became the Vulgate, Vulgata meaning common language, from Hebrew. Um, Jerome didn't like Greek. He thought um, God only really spoke Hebrew. Um, so he used existing translations for the most part from the Greek parts of the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, but retranslated the Hebrew. But he wanted to be as near as possible to the cave where our Lord was born because he realized there's an interface between the incarnation and birth of our Lord at Bethlehem and the way God speaks through the Holy Scriptures. Both are the incarnate word of God. And he was very anxious by his way of life and in being in that cave next to the cave of the nativity to show that in a tangible way. And St. Jerome came out with a very important phrase that every um, seminarian knows so well, um, and I'm sure you do as well. Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. So if we don't know the scriptures, we don't know Christ. That's what St. Jerome taught. And along with that, to lengthen that a bit, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ and the Holy Eucharist. Because, of course, when we're talking about the Holy Eucharist, we're talking about Jesus Christ. So ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of the Holy Eucharist. Now that's rather a bold statement, but I'd stand by it in front of all the uh, bishops that are assembled here as well. And um, secondly, we follow, we've, we need to follow the fundamental hermeneutical principles of the Catholic Church in order to understand the scriptures properly. Hermeneutics is a big word, isn't it, really? I sometimes use it in the parish on Sundays, and people say, what on earth is he talking about again now? But um, hermeneutics um, comes from the Greek verb hermenouin, and it means to interpret. Do you remember when uh, Jesus is on the road to Emmaus with the disciples in Luke chapter 24? It says there that he explained in all the passages of scripture um, those texts that were about himself. And that verb is hermenouin, to interpret. And the, any Christian group or any Jewish group or any group following any book in any religion has rules of interpretation. They might not be very big as far as rules are concerned, but they're all there. And these rules stop us from being fundamentalists and open us up to the mystery of what the church and the sacraments are all about. And I'll come on to look at those later. But the principles that are there for the interpretation of the scriptures are also there for the interpretation of the Holy Eucharist. And again, I'll explain that a bit later on. And thirdly, we need to recognize the deep questions um, of our human existence and the needs that we have as human beings. Because we live in this society in 2018, um, whether it's in, in Liverpool or in, in, in Westminster or in Rome or wherever it might be, we live here and now. Um, the professors at the Gregorian University in Rome always kept saying, he kept nunc, which means here and now. And, and here and now changes very quickly, as we know, because the world and our society and the matrix in which the church exists has changed enormously, even over the last 10 years. We don't stand still as a society or as a community. That's a nice picture, isn't it? I've just put, what a crowd there. Um, if I'm not in England, I always like to be in Rome or Jerusalem. So that, that's Rome, as you can see. Um, then one of the issues that we all ask as human beings, which we have to confront because we all ask them, is uh, those are those that are ontological. You know what ontology is, don't you? The, 
the study of being. I can't see whether you're nodding or not. Um, the study of being. So that's Parmenides. And Parmenides was the famous Greek philosopher that really started the study of ontology. What am I? What is my life about? What am I here for? What is the purpose of my existence? What is the purpose of your existence? Do we believe in God? Is there a higher reality beyond what I see, touch, taste, and smell with my human senses? These are questions, ultimately, that everybody asks, because we need to. We need to ask what our life is about and what our life is for. What's the purpose of my existence? And alongside that, we have, um, I, not um, I hope you notice some of the titles at the top of these, um, uh, these slides just here. Um, one of my friends is very keen on the Beatles. I'll just leave it like that. Um, so these, um, uh, these is a hierarchy of needs, along with the questions of what is my personal being about, the needs that we have as human beings. And one of the um, orders of these needs that has been very prominent over decades is that of Abraham Maslow. Um, he's still used in some psychological and educational institutions. Indeed, uh, these are seminal uh, understandings of our needs as human beings. Um, Abraham Maslow was a, a lapsed Jew. Um, so a lot of what he talks about ultimately uh, is within that context. But he talks about physiological needs, safety needs, love and needs, and then about esteem needs, and then about self-actualization. Why do I mention all of this? Because all of these we come across in our pastoral life, not just as priests and deacons and bishops, but as human beings in the way that we relate uh, to each other. When somebody comes to see me with a pastoral problem, um, we talk about what the meaning of life is quite often and what the needs are of any human being. And alongside that, we talk about, and we need to talk about in our parish communities and our dioceses, we need to talk about what our ultimate existence is about, well, we know what it is about, the ultimate existence, but we still need to talk about what that means on the ground today in 2018. And we still need to talk about um, what our uh, desires are and what we need for that particular diocese or that parish in that particular sociological um, point in our life. Because, of course, we need really to start with the sociological, psychological, and human matrix in which we exist before we can begin to understand anything else. It's fundamental to look at where we are, where we want to be, and where we are headed ultimately. Now, these questions are very much there within the scriptures. Um, and also the scriptures help to give us answers to those fundamental human questions and questions of society. And these scriptures are very clever. Well, of course, they're, they're from God, but they're very clever in the way that they don't always start uh, from the nature of God, where we think we ought to be, but where we actually are. And particularly the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, I'm sure uh, when I say the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, you know what books I'm talking about. Um, but amongst others, rather Psalms, of course, the book of Proverbs, and then some of the most amazing books of the scriptures, which are the Song of Songs, Job and Koheleth. I like that one there, keep calm and read Koheleth. Um, one of the um, Catholic trivia questions would well be, um, what is the other name for Koheleth? Ecclesiastes, yes, that's right. If you said Ecclesiasticus, that's the other name for Sirach. Thank you. There's some very clever people in the front row. Um, 
so the, one of the most important books of the scriptures is the Song of Songs. Rabbi Akiva, from just after the time of the Lord, said all the scriptures are sacred, but the song is the most sacred. It's a series of ancient erotic love poems that were, from a very early date, interpreted in a manner that showed that God was the bridegroom and the human person and the community uh, were the bride. But it talks about the deepest needs of us as human beings. Love, sexuality, what we do with all of that, and how it's really within the context of marriage that th that comes to be so fruitful. Job, remember, asks the questions of suffering. What is the role of suffering? How can God be just if we talk about suffering? Um, if he allows innocent people to suffer, how can he possibly be a just God? And Job goes through the most immense pain before he understands his asking questions beyond his control. And Koheleth, Koheleth is a wonderful book of the Bible um, because it is almost completely nihilistic from one level. What's the purpose of life? What's the point of doing anything? What's the point of working? What's the point of leaving money to the next generation? What's the point of eating and drinking? What's the point of trying to build up society? And the last piece, piece de resistance is really, what's the point of study? He says, uh, you know, if we study too much, it's a weariness of the flesh. But the other way of looking at Kohalath in all this negativity is that he says, in the end, that if we eat and drink and enjoy our life and fear the Lord, and fear the Lord in the scriptures, as you know, means to reverence the Lord, to revere the Lord. It doesn't mean being like a god and hidden, or like a dog hidden in the corner and, and therefore uh, really frightened. To fear the Lord is to revere the Lord. So just very briefly then, all the big questions of our human life are there within the scriptures and they are given some kind of answer. And that is true also for the Holy Eucharist, that when we meditate and focus upon the Holy Eucharist, we have a really important answer to our lives. And by the Eucharist, I'm not just talking about putting the host in the monstrance, of course. We're talking about the mystery of the celebration of the Eucharist. Now, three very important needs for our Christian communities um, that I would argue to be are the following. Um, you could add to these or take them away. But I think if we're going to grow as human beings in a real way, then we need these three aspects of our life. Firstly, the need for adoration and worship that is structured and follows a specific pattern. Sacrifice is essential to our human nature. From the earliest times, people have sacrificed animals and even human beings to appease the gods or to help fertility. And we see that again and again in so many religions. And if we don't adore, if we don't open up and venerate uh, something beyond ourselves, then we're very closed, or we can be very closed. It's a basic human need to grow, to adore. Secondly, the need to belong to a community that is welcoming, warm, and vibrant. That's crucial as well, because we need to belong. And belonging has changed enormously over the last years uh, within our society, from a sociological point of view. And that's why I think so many of our parish communities have changed, because that desire to belong has become less and less for some people. That's not so within some of our community elements. In, in my parish, we're very international, like so many parishes. We've got 52 um, different languages spoken. But the Filipino community, for example, those of you that are Filipinos, um, the Filipinos, you can't have a gathering without faith and without food. 
Those are very important elements. And the same within our Carolyn communities as well. There's no problem about belonging. There's more of a problem sometimes with uh, the Anglo-Irish belonging than there is with other communities in our world and in our parishes. And thirdly, there's the need to be altruistic and ensure the development of justice and peace. Now, I would argue if we don't follow those three elements, we're going to be less than human. And this all interfaces, obviously, with the Eucharist itself. So there just um, is a, a picture of those huge temples at Luxor about sacrifice. Um, have you been to um, Egypt on an, an, on an Egyptian cruise? It's one of the, it, I, I'd never realized till I went uh, with a, a, a scripture scholar friend of mine how important it is to see the size of those temples if you go down on a, a river cruise between Luxor and Aswan. I recommend it um, if you have the time and the energy and, of course, the money. Um, so those are some of the huge temples that were built uh, from the third century originally, the third millennium uh, BC. The need to worship, the need to offer sacrifice, because sacrifice is why temples exist. Sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem, as we'll see in a minute, uh, was the core of what went on in the temple. There's no point in having temples and altars without sacrifice. And then, secondly, the need to be part of a human society. Do you like that one? No man is an island apart from the Isle of Man. So I, I put no person is an island, but it doesn't work like that. So sorry, ladies. Um, but we need to belong to each other. If we don't try and belong, then we're narrow and introverted, or that's the danger. And then thirdly, there, I want to hold your hand. I hope you noticed that one as well. Um, the egoist and the altruist, being open to others, Choose altruism because selfish, selfishism, that's a very odd word, isn't it? It's a lonely, cold, dark hole. I didn't write that, so don't complain. Um, then, um, that's obviously a scene of the Second Vatican Council. So the first thing is the third thing I mentioned, so I'm, uh, it's rather complicated. But the first need that we we have if we're going to really understand the scriptures and veneration of the scriptures and the Holy Eucharist is to understand where we come from, what our needs are and where we're going. Because that human matrix is absolutely crucial. We live in a society, we live in a family, we live in different groups. But for those of us that belong to the church, the group of the parish is crucial. So we need to help each other, in my opinion and my reflection and my prayer, to build up always the community in which we belong. And it's no good, an old friend of mine a few years ago said, it's no good inviting people to come back to church if when they come back to church um, we're miserable and dull and boring. Um, we need to be a lively parish community. So that doesn't mean to say always smiling and dancing. But it does mean being a community that is tangibly one of life. Now, the second thing, then, that's, that's the first point I'm, I'm making, is that if we're going to grow in our understanding of the Eucharist and the Scriptures, we need to know our human needs and how they pan out within the community. The second thing is to understand Catholic hermeneutical principles. Can you read that? It's a bit small, isn't it? Um, can you read it? Yeah, okay. Thank you for shouting out that. So there are three major hermeneutical principles. These are interpretative principles if we're going to understand the scriptures properly. And I'm afraid so many of us do not understand these uh, except in a very um, low level way. That's okay, but as, as long as we can at least be aware of them. The first is that the Holy Scriptures are written under the influence of the Holy Spirit and therefore teach us um, the truth for our salvation. So all the Scriptures teach, teach us truth, but truth for our salvation. So they don't teach us scientific, historical, geographical truths. 
which is, that would be fundamentalism. But they teach us the truth for our salvation. So any text of the scriptures needs to be approached with that in mind. What truths are we being taught for our salvation? Secondly, the scriptures are written by real human beings um, over many, many centuries. And therefore, the scriptures reveal, again, the sociological matrix in which those scriptures developed. Therefore, we need to study. We, we, we need to use our brain. And if we haven't got one, sometimes, then we need to go to the scripture scholars to help us understand the literary forms, um, what's known as the sitzen im Leben, the setting in life of the scriptures, where they come from. For example, um, many people say they don't like the Old Testament because it's full of a God of war, it's full of a God of hatred, he teaches others to be hate hating, he wants his people to murder other people, and so on and so forth. We need to understand that that is how people thought God to be, not how he is. The ancient Israelites thought God precisely um, was a God of, who fought for them and looked after them because the other nations around the pagan nations thought exactly the same. And your God isn't much cop if he doesn't look after you. So it comes from the real understanding of what people wanted their God to be. It's not a truth that God is full of hatred and war. And the third element is that the scriptures are to be looked at as a whole, along with the tradition of the church. Now all those three elements, that God is the author, that they're written by human beings, that we need to take the scriptures as a whole, along with the tradition of the church, are ones that we can, all, that we can offer as well for a deeper understanding of the Holy Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist, of course, comes from God. It comes also from the community in which we live with all that human element that we have, including the bread and wine, of course. There's a human element of every liturgy. And then thirdly, we only understand the Eucharist along with the tradition uh, of the church and the scriptures that come along with that tradition. So that's just um, the Old Testament. Yesterday, that's a Beatles song, isn't it, as well? Um, three approaches when we're looking at the Old Testament, and I'll just go through these very briefly. Um, as far as the Old Testament and the Eucharist is concerned, the Old Testament has little or nothing to offer. The Old Testament is important but not unique because it borrows other influences from the ancient world. And that's very much within some um, television documentaries that you still see today, that the Old Testament has just borrowed things and therefore it's not unique. And thirdly, that the Old Testament gives us a direct background to the origins of the Eucharist. And many of these are known to be types. Type is um, saying that there's, a, there's an element that is then fulfilled. We have to be a bit careful with that approach. But as far as the types are concerned, we see those texts from the Old Testament, like the first readings, uh, we've had John chapter 6 um, during August, haven't we? And, and the first reading for every one of the masses was a different part of the Old Testament to explain something about the mystery of the bread of life. Worship and adoration in general, guidance and feeding narratives, sacrifices. Now sacrifice, as I say, is very important for the Old Testament and sacrifices are crucial for understanding of the Jewish background and the Hebrew background for the Old Testament, especially the Holocaust, the cereal offerings, the peace offerings, and the sin offerings. The last three were given to priests as well as uh, to people. And then um, the Passover, the Messianic banquet, Wisdom's banquet, I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of these because it's boring for you sitting there. The sealing of the covenant, the unity of worship and the one temple for offering sacrifices. Lezikron, Esenamnesin, the Hebrew word Lezikron, Zakar. Exodus says that you shall keep this as a memorial day through all the generations. That's the Passover. And Jesus says, I'm offering at the Last Supper to his disciples this Esenamnesin, 
in memory of me. And that's got a very specific biblical meaning, which means not just having a mental idea of what happened in the past, but bringing to life here and now what is already there. So we transcend time and we actually live in the present. And that biblical understanding of time, that somehow there's no past, present, and future so much as we're involved in it now, is so important for understanding the Holy Eucharist. So when we're understanding the Holy Eucharist, we're understanding the mystery of Calvary and the Garden of the Resurrection. It's all one together from that biblical notion of time. And then pilgrimage to Jerusalem. As far as the New Testament is concerned, we have the major texts. Again, I'm, I'm sure you've all studied these in details. The feeding miracles of the Gospels, the institution narratives. Remember that 1 Corinthians is the oldest of the institution narratives, and it's probably Mark, and then Matthew and Luke, and John doesn't have an institution narrative, as you know, that John chapter 6 that we've been listening to over the last weeks. Um, that's number three there. Number four, the road to Emmaus gives us an insight into the twofold nature of the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. I like this one. I'm sorry if you're shocked by it. Jesus, hey mum, guess what? I fed a crowd of, on a few fish and five loaves today. Mary, son, what were you thinking? Where were the veggies? <laughs> so I just found that one. Um, do this in memory of me. As I say, asenamnesin, to do it in memory of the Lord, absolutely crucial. The long and winding road, the story of Emmaus there, that Caravaggio from uh, the National Gallery. So the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament is important because it centers upon blood as well. Many of the texts of the New Testament don't mention blood so much, but blood is essential uh, for the Hebrew sacrifices. So it's something that is very important to remember. Now, the other thing, just to finish off today, that's a synagogue rather than a church, um, is the Jewish liturgical milieu. Uh, we need to recover that to understand the matrix of the scriptures and the matrix of the Eucharist. Um, so, the most important backgrounds are the Berachoth, um, which are the blessings, the Hodayoth, um, the prayer of praise in the scriptures. This is all, you'll be able to read all of this on the, um, the website, I hope, or I'll have to write it again, probably. The Shema Israel, the great Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, which is said so many times a day by our Jewish brothers and sisters. Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four to six. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, the centrality of monotheism. The Amida, which are the prayers that are said again every day, and the 19 uh, Amida blessings. And the Birkat Hamatzon, which means the blessings at table. The Haggadah that's recited at the Pesach, which is the Passover. The Kedush of Sab Shabbat Eve, when the mother uh, lights the candles and says the prayer of the candles and the chala is broken. The Shabbat synagogue service and the temple Zebachim, uh, which are the sacrifices. And the Jewish feasts, particularly the high holy days. Um, I'm just going to finish. I'm sorry, that's a, what I wanted to do today is just to give an overview because we can look at any single texts um, but we need to have an overview, I think, if we're going to see how the scriptures link with the Eucharist. And um, one of my favorite Jewish feasts, and I often think we're very, um, we've been very thin, if that's a word, by not taking the Jewish feasts into uh, Christianity. But one of my favorite Jewish feasts is um, Simchat Torah. Have you heard of Simchat Torah? I can just see one or two of you smiling. Simhat Torah comes at the end of Sukkot. Sukkot is tabernacles. And Simhat Torah is when the scrolls of the law are taken out of the synagogue and they're, they're, they're paraded through the streets with a canopy above them and there's lots of dancing and singing. It's rejoicing in the law. And so the Torah is given the most immense honor. It always is, but especially on Simhat Torah. And I think um, that we can learn from that. 
Um, a friend of mine who's a priest in Brooklyn Diocese, um, his mum's dead now, but he, um, uh, his mum told me she um, lived on a street at St. Rose of Lima Parish in Brooklyn, and the street was entirely Catholic. And uh, they used to have blessed sacrament processions down the street um, around Corpus Christi. And she said it was wonderful. And then gradually all the Catholics moved out, and it was then filled with Jews, and she was the only Catholic left. But at Simhat Torah, the procession went down the street uh, with the scrolls of the law and with the canopy above it. And she said it just reminded her completely of uh, the Blessed Sacrament processions. So my one plea, some people went like this, but um, in front of Blessed Sacrament processions, when we do have Blessed Sacrament processions, we need to honor somehow the Holy Scriptures as well. So not just to have the monstrance with the Blessed Sacrament, but somehow the scriptures to show that equivalence uh, between them. And what we learn from the scriptures, we give to the Blessed Sacrament. What we learn from the Blessed Sacrament, we give to the scriptures. So that's an encouragement to you, I hope, just to study the scriptures more, including uh, within the context of understanding the Blessed Sacrament. So thank you very much. Looking for life-changing entertainment? Does what you see on most channels leave you feeling unfulfilled? Well, look no further. Shalom World TV brings the peace and joy of Jesus Christ to you, whether at home or on the go. To start watching, you don't need antennas, cable connections, or a dish. You probably already have what you need, if you have a smart TV, such as a Samsung, LG, or Panasonic, or if you have one with an Android, Opera, or Roku TV operating system. These can be found on the latest models of Sony, Toshiba, Vizio, Philips, RCA, Sharp Aquos, TCL, Insignia, Element, Hitachi, Vestal, Skyworth, Chang Hong, Konka, and Hisense. You can also watch Shalom TV on most IPTV streaming devices, starting with the fourth generation of Apple TV and Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Mi Box, Amino, Humax, or on TiVo Box through the Opera TV store. Are you a gamer or virtual reality enthusiast? We've got you covered. Shalom World is on Xbox One, Razer Forge, Nvidia Shield, and HoloLens. To start watching, all you have to do is go to the App Store, download Shalom World, and start being fulfilled by content that brings you into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. For more information on how to watch Shalom World on your TVs and devices, visit us at shalomworld.org slash connected TV. Have a smartphone or tablet? Take Shalom with you wherever you go. Again, by downloading Shalom World from the App Store. If you prefer to watch from your Mac or PC, get the Shalom World desktop app. Or you can always watch from our website, shalomworld.org. And guess what? Shalom World is absolutely free on all of these platforms. Yes, free. There are no download charges and no in-store app purchases required, ever. If you're looking for life-changing entertainment, you found it. It's here, waiting for you on your Shalom World.